Well, we're going to talk about musical sounds, and we probably ought to start by thinking about how you describe a musical sound. Well, there are many ways in which it can be done. One of my favourites uh, is to use uh, cartoons. Uh, this is uh, one of uh, Gerard Hoffman's cartoons illustrating a thud. And uh, I think it's quite a graphic sort of description. This is, uh, the next one is Gerard Hoffman's description of a ping, <laughs> which is equally graphic. Uh, the next one is the sort of thing that hi-fi enthusiasts dread, a hum. <laughs> Uh, there's another cartoonist, too, who's done a lot of work of this kind, and that's Saul Steinberg, the American cartoonist. Uh, and this is one of his. Um, I think you'd agree that that particular double bass player is obviously very confident. Uh, he's producing a very strong, incisive sort of sound, and you can really hear him, you know, being really confident about it. Hoffnung had a go at a double bass, but his was a lot more tentative. It's this one. <laughs> But I think really in this category, my favourite of all the cartoons is a Saul Steinberg. It's this one. <laughs> and I think if ever you talked about hearing with your eyes, this is it. You can really hear that lovely fruity oomph sound coming out of the tuba without actually any sound at all. Well, that's maybe a little bit frivolous, but it's one way in which you can describe musical sounds. Musicians use a slightly more serious way of doing it. Uh, this is a typical description of a musical sound, and if you put that in front of any reasonably competent orchestra, they would probably produce roughly the same sort of sound. Uh, and therefore, you might think it was fairly precise. Well, it is fairly precise in the sense that the pitches are fairly well defined, the position of the notes on the stave, and the time durations, the, the shapes of the notes, are fairly well defined. But it's very imprecise as far as tonal quality is concerned. Because, you see, the only indication of the differences in quality are the initials on the left-hand edge. Starting at the top, we've got flute, oboe, clarinet, etc. Uh, and that is really a very imprecise description. If we go down to the third and fourth lines from the bottom, they're bracketed together and they're just given the initials VL for violin. I've never yet seen a score which said violin bracket Stradivarius type. And what I'm going to do to start with is just to play one or two recordings. Many of you will have seen this before, I'm quite sure. But what I want you to try to do is to relate what you hear with what you see on the screen. And uh, in true university style, after I've shown you one or two, we'll have a test to see how well you've got on. Uh, well, here's the first of those uh, recordings coming up now. That's the recording I always take with me, and then if you hadn't turned up, I could have played it to myself and <laughs> pretended I had an audience. Because, in fact, it was an audience turning up to a lecture that I was going to give. And uh, the interesting thing about it is that if you looked at the screen, it was really a more or less formless jumble, wasn't it? It would be very difficult to describe what you saw, except for a lot of spikes or squiggles or using some expression of that kind. And yet, listening to the record, you could hear the odd cough, the odd giggle, all sorts of conversation going on, and you could actually pick those different things out. You could, you, I don't know whether you noticed, but there was one particular giggle at one point which, which stood out quite strongly. And yet, if you're looking at the screen, there was only one wave trace. In other words, the pressure only has one value at one moment in time. And this is a quite remarkable thing, really. See, if, supposing there was a baby crying out there and a dog barking out there and a fire engine going by outside, uh, you would probably notice those different sounds, but provided it wasn't your baby and your dog and it wasn't your house that's on fire, you'll probably go on listening to what I'm saying uh, without being too disturbed, uh, unless it got too loud. And yet, you see, the various pressure changes that those different sources of sound are producing 
just add together. And what finally gets to your ear is just the sum of the lot. And that's why on the screen we just saw one trace. And yet the ear-brain system is able to take that trace and disentangle the, the components. And if you're listening to an orchestra, you can pick out the violin or the oboe or whatever. And uh, we have some idea about how that's done, but we're not by any means convinced that we know the whole story. Later on, I'll come on to that. Well, that's one sort of sound. See if you can see on the screen what the difference is between that and the one that I'm going to play you now. Well, um, what were the differences? Well, you could probably see some sort of change with the rhythm, and you might therefore have deduced that it was music if you're looking at it, but it was still a pretty random jumble of squiggles. What was it on the screen that told you that that was Mendelssohn, as opposed to Beethoven or Bach? Do you think if I showed you a trace without the sound, you could tell who the composer was? Uh, I have a slight suspicion that you wouldn't be able to do. But nevertheless, you see, all the information is there. The same information that you're getting via your ear uh, normally is there via the visual channel, and it doesn't really do you a great deal of good. Here's a different sort of sound. Well, there, I think you might have deduced that that was pop music because you could see a fairly steady beat. But whether you could have told that it was the Pink Floyd, if you didn't know, I'm not sure. Well, now, at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the loudspeakers so that you can't hear the next one. <laughs> and uh, we're just going to show you it. And let's see if you can then deduce what sort of a sound it is and if it's music, who the composer is, etc. <laughs> Here it comes now. Well, there we are. You are getting all the information that you need, you see, on the screen. Now, uh, any bids? <laughs> what do you think it was? Anybody think it was uh, pop music? No? Classical music, somebody said. Classical violin. Any, any other bids? Well, <laughs> well, you see, we've got all kinds of bids there. What I do is I put the loudspeakers back on again, uh, and we play exactly the same recording again, and you can see and hear exactly what it was. <clears throat> well, as you could hear, it was in fact an orchestra tuning up. <laughs> and uh, I chose that deliberately because it, in a way, sums up the problem of uh, psychoacoustic research, you see, because that was music in the sense that it was made by musical instruments, but it was noise in the sense that you wouldn't pay whatever the going rate is in Sydney to listen to that for more than a few minutes. It's all right for perhaps uh, two or three minutes at the beginning of the program to whet your appetite, but I don't know of any, even the most avant-garde composer that's ever actually used that as part of a symphony or something of that kind.